thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, today, I'll be telling you about some of the work that my lab has been doing uh, to understand how RAS signaling regulates the non-coding transcriptome. And so, as many of you know, the non-coding transcriptome is quite extensive. Uh, we know from many efforts over the past decade where uh, the ENCODE consortium and others have really done very deep sequencing of, of, the, um, of the human genome. And what we have seen and appreciated from this is that um, approximately 75 to 80% of the human genome encodes uh, RNA. And uh, what was actually quite surprising is that only about 1% to 2% of the uh, human genomic space uh, comprises protein coding genes. And so um, we really wanted to better understand this, uh, this RNA dark matter that's being transcribed but is not being translated into protein. And so um, this is just a classic uh, review from, from John Rin and, and Howard Chang where they, they really characterize all of the different classes of non-coding RNAs that have been discovered over the past uh, decades. And um, you know, there are probably some of your favorite uh, non-coding RNAs here, such as EXIST, the long non-coding RNA that codes the inactive X chromosome. Uh, and so what we've really appreciated is that uh, since this review came out, a lot of efforts have shown that um, there are potentially tens of thousands of these long non-coding RNAs. There was um, some work from Rural Chennai's group in Michigan where they showed that potentially there are upwards of 58,000 of these long non-coding RNA genes in the human genome. And so we're really interested in understanding um, how those non-coding RNAs are behaving in the context of both development and diseases such as cancer. Uh, but also we wanted to really focus on the other parts of the the, the non-coding genome that are perhaps less well annotated, and these comprise uh, transposable elements. And so we know from um, a lot of these uh, genomic studies that more than half of the human genome is comprised of, of these repetitive elements. Uh, in particular, there are a lot of these retrotransposons, such as line elements and sign elements. Um, and importantly, these um, are transcribed into RNA at, at different stages of development and also reactivated in the context of different diseases. Uh, but what was really uh, quite nice about uh, these RNAs is that um, they're polyadenylated, such as uh, line one RNAs, uh, transcribed by RNA pol two are polyadenylated, as well as uh, pol three transcribed um, alu elements are also polyadenylated. So when people do these typical RNA sequencing experiments, um, all of this transposable element uh, derived non-coding RNA is present within uh, these data sets. And so we really wanted to better understand not only these well annotated non-coding RNAs, such as link RNAs, but really how the rest of the transcriptomes, such as uh, the RNAs that are coming from these repetitive sequences are also being uh, regulated in the context of development and disease. And in particular, we've been focusing on RAS-driven cancers. We know that um, more than 30% of all human cancers are driven by mutations in RAS genes themselves, such as KRAS, which is predominantly mutated in pancreatic cancers, colorectal cancers, and lung cancers. Uh, and we know that in many of these instances that KRAS mutations are kind of this initial driver of oncogenic transformation. But we also know that in addition to the RAS genes themselves, genes that are upstream and downstream of the RAS signaling pathway are also mutated and perturbed in the context of many different cancers. And so um, really um, the question that my lab has been trying to address is how does RAS regulate this, this non-coding transcriptome or this RNA dark matter, uh, specifically in the context of lung and pancreatic cancers where this is an initial event. So we really wanted to understand uh, what are kind of the early earliest uh, changes in terms of how the transcriptome is responding to this oncogenic RAS signaling uh, in the context of lung and pancreatic cancers. And so uh, you, you're probably very familiar with the RAS signaling pathway, and it's a very complex pathway. This is actually a very simplified uh, diagram of the RAS signaling pathway from Frank McCormick's lab. And so um, what you can appreciate is that there are several different RAS genes, uh, and we'll be focusing on KRAS today. Uh, but what you can also appreciate is that there are many downstream effectors of the RAS signaling pathway. And so we really wanted to Kind of understand how this is really affecting these uh, non-coding RNAs, but as you can appreciate from this diagram, there are no uh, non-coding genes uh, labeled here. And so really there's a, there's a clear gap in our understanding of how does this very fundamental signaling pathway that is required for proliferation and even for uh, just normal development, um, how does this pathway kind of regulate the non-coding transcriptome in the context of both normal development as well as uh, during cancer initiation? And so we wanted to use a very simple system. And so this is a system that was developed by Bill Hahn's lab where um, you can take these human uh, lung airway epithelial cells and simply introduce mutant KRAS into these cells, which will induce 
oncogenic transformation. And so otherwise these cells have no known uh, mutations in any oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. And we wanted to basically profile how the non-coding transcriptome was changing. So we performed um, bulk RNA sequencing, we performed single cell RNA sequencing to really understand the heterogeneity of this initial response to oncogenic RAS signaling uh, at the transcriptome level. And we also wanted to perform um, a tax seek to understand how is oncogenic RAS signaling reprogramming the non-coding transcriptome and how is this um, really kind of um, working at the epigenomic level. And so um, again, we wanted to understand uh, if we could identify these non-coding RNA signatures of mutant KRAS as well as how they are potentially regulated. And so we performed um, RNA-seq on both the mutant KRAS-containing uh, lung airway epithelial cells, as well as uh, control cells that had been uh, transduced with only an empty vector alone. And here I'm showing you just a volcano plot of all of the significantly differentially expressed genes in the mutant KRAS cells. You can see that many genes are going up, many genes are going down. And we also wanted to see, um, is this a specific response to lung cells? So we wanted to also look at kind of a, a different cell type. We looked at a human embryonic kidney cells, which also are similar in vitro model, where if you simply introduce mutant KRAS, you'll also get uh, uh, oncogenic transformation. And so when we performed RNA-seq uh, on these cells as well, we see that there's a different set of RNAs that are differentially expressed um, in these um, human embryonic kidney cells with the same oncogenic uh, mutant KRAS signaling. And so we wanted to see what are the gene sets that are enriched in these mutant KRAS lung cells. So we performed gene set enrichment analysis. And what was really quite surprising is that the most um, enriched gene sets were these interferon related genes. So interferon alpha response and interferon gamma response are among the highest, uh, most enriched gene sets within these, um, these mutant KRAS lung cells. And then when we compare that to um, the genes that were being upregulated in the kidney cells, um, we saw that uh, surprisingly that these interferon genes were now the most uh, downregulated um, gene sets within these, uh, these kidney cells. So kind of the opposite of what you uh, see in the lung cells. And so we wanted to kind of uh, do a deeper dive into what these interferon related genes might be. So here what I'm showing you is the differentially expressed interferon uh, related genes uh, that are significantly upregulated in the mutant KRAS lung cells. And so here this kind of comprises our, our KRAS interferon stimulated gene signature or ISG signature. And so you can see that there are many different um, ISGs that are being significantly upregulated. So we wanted to compare what is the overlap between our signature, this KRAS ISG signature, as well as these hallmark interferon response uh, gene sets. And so you can see that there is some degree of overlap with these hallmark interferon response signatures. And we also compared it to um, a recently um, published study that showed that there are these intrinsic interferon stimulated gene signatures in a lot of different cancer cells. And so um, uh, these cells seem to be ADAR dependent and uh, we wanted to see what was the overlap there. And we see that there is also some degree of overlap between these interferon stimulated genes uh, in these ADAR dependent cancer cells, as well as in our lung cancer uh, model driven by KRAS. And so we think that potentially mutant KRAS signaling is contributing to this intrinsic interferon stimulated gene response. And so we really wanted to understand what is the heterogeneity of the response of these lung cells to this oncogenic RAS signaling. And so here I'm just showing you some 10X single cell RNA sequencing data. And here in the UMAP, you can see the different clusters of the, the different um, uh, cell type or the different states that arise within these, these mutant KRAS lung cells. And um, what was interesting is that when we looked at these different clusters, here you can see that the KRAS signaling um, genes are all relatively um, uniformly upregulated across the entire population. But what was quite surprising is that these interferon stimulated genes were only um, really highly upregulated in a subset of these cells, in these cells in cluster four. And so we do see that there are other cells in these other clusters that exhibit this interferon stimulated gene signature, but predominantly it seems that um, a lot of the signal is being driven by this uh, particular cluster four here. So we wanted to understand what is uh, the regulation of this, um, this particular interferon stimulated gene response. Is it at the level of transcription? So we wanted to perform a tax seek to understand how the epigenome was being reprogrammed. And so here, these are the same four gene sets that I just showed you. Uh, this is the KRAS signaling up genes. So you can see that there is an increase in chromatin accessibility at the, at the promoter region of these KRAS uh, related genes in the mutant KRAS cells versus the control cells. We could see that also in our KRAS interferon stimulated gene signature genes that there's also an open um, chromatin uh, conformation here at the, at the promoter regions of these ISGs in these mutant KRAS cells specifically. So what we're uh, seeing is that 
when we introduce mutant KRAS into these lung cells, that this leads to kind of this opening of the chromatin at the promoter regions of these um, interferon stimulated genes um, that are being upregulated in our lung uh, cancer uh, model. And so here, um, uh, I have to show you this UCSC genome browser uh, plot because we're at UCSC. Um, but here, what you can see is that if you compare these different um, interferon stimulated genes that we see are significantly upregulated, um, we can see that at the at the chromatin level, uh, based on the uh, accessibility by ataxic, you can see that, for example, in IRF9, there's kind of already an open chromatin state in the control cells, which kind of uh, increases the, the, the opening of that uh, kind of increases in the KRAS cells. But then if you look at kind of these downstream interferon stimulated genes, you can see that there's no open chromatin at OAS2 in the control cells based on ataxic, based on RNA-seq, we don't really see much expression in these control lung cells. But then when you introduce mutant KRAS, we see that there is this opening of the chromatin there in terms of the accessibility at the five prime end, and also the RNA levels are going up. And we can see that there is this motif, uh, ISRE for IRF9. Uh, so we think that um, IRF9 is potentially remodeling uh, the chromatin here and activating expression of these interferon genes uh, at the transcriptional level. But we also wanted to see, is there a potential role for RNA as well in inducing this interferon stimulated gene response? And we know from recent efforts by several groups that transposable element RNAs can induce this interferon stimulated gene response in the context of cancer cells. And so here what I'm showing you is a volcano plot showing the differentially expressed transposable elements in the mutant KRAS cells compared to the control lung cells. And you can see that there are ALU elements that are significantly upregulated as well as line elements as well. Uh, and so here, when we looked at this at the single cell level, um, we could see that there is a relatively uniform um, upregulation of ALU and the mutant KRAS as well as line. You can see that there are some LPRs that are more highly expressed in, in cluster two, for example, as well as these MER elements. And so we wanted to see kind of what is the, the mechanism for how these RNAs might be inducing these interferon related uh, genes within the context of mutant KRAS cells. So here I'm just showing you two uh, significantly upregulated transposable elements within the mutant KRAS cells. And this is again at the single cell level. So as you can see that there's not much uh, variation in terms of the expression of these um, transposable elements within these single cells across the five different clusters. But then when we looked at RNA editing of these transposons, we see that in cluster four, there is a significant loss of RNA editing um, of these um, ALU sequences, for example, that are being significantly upregulated. And when we looked at the, the corresponding interferon stimulated genes, we see that these uh, pattern recognition receptors, such as PKR, RIGI, and MBA5, which can recognize uh, these transposable elements as non-self when they're uh, when they lose this RNA editing, they're upregulated specifically in uh, the cluster that shows the lowest uh, levels of RNA editing. Interestingly, PKR seems to be upregulated across all of these clusters and just slightly more upregulated in cluster four. And so we think that um, this, uh, this uh, loss of editing at these transposable element drive non-coding RNAs is contributing to um, this um, upregulation of these interferon stimulated genes, which could then um, activate additional interferon stimulated genes that are downstream. And so we wanted to understand what is the potential mechanism for how these non-coding RNAs are being upregulated, especially the ones that are coming from these transposable elements. And we know from uh, many groups around the world that crab zinc finger genes are involved uh, in repressing these transposable elements in the human genome. We know this from work from my colleague David Hauser's lab and others that, uh, for example, crab zinc finger genes can repress uh, specific line elements or other transposable elements. And what we saw that was really quite striking is that when we look at all of the crab zinc finger genes and all of the zinc finger genes, in fact, uh, these 300 plus uh, transcription factors in the human genome, uh, in these mutant KRS lung cells, that there is this broad global downregulation of these crab zinc finger genes in the mutant KRAS cells, which was really quite surprising to us. We don't see any crab zinc finger genes that are being upregulated. It's uh, all kind of this downregulation effect uh, in these mutant KRAS cells. And we could see that this is at the level of transcription, where uh, if you again look at the ataxic data in the control cells, um, these uh, have very nice uh, open chromatin at the five prime ends of these ZNFs that are significantly downregulated in mutant KRAS cells. You can see their expression at the RNA level. But then when you introduce mutant KRAS, you can see that there's a loss of this accessibility at the five prime end of these KZNF genes uh, across these uh, representative examples. And what was interesting is that if you look at the, the open chromatin uh, regions that are being closed in the KRAS mutant cells, we could see significant enrichment of these motifs uh, that are from these um, brass signaling genes, these genes 
that are transcription factors downstream of the RAS signaling pathway that are being activated and in turn repressing these, these crab zinc finger genes. And so uh, when we look at um, ChIP-seq data from uh, publicly available uh, data sets, uh, we can see that some of these TEs that are being significantly upregulated are normally bound by the, the crab zinc finger genes that are significantly downregulated. For example, this, this MER element is significantly bound by these two ZNFs, which are significantly downregulated in the KRAS mutant state, as well as, for example, this LIDE1 element, which is bound by this CNF605. And so... Um, we wanted to see what is the relevance of this in vitro model to actual in vivo tumors. And so we took the, the cancer genome atlas data for all lung adenocarcinomas that have known mutations in KRAS. And so here what we can see is that if we look at the lung adenocarcinoma RNA-seq data across these different mutant KRAS uh, conditions and compare that to, to quote unquote healthy lung RNA-seq data from the GTEx consortium, we could see that for all of the ZNFs that are significantly downregulated in our in vitro system just when we introduce mutant KRAS, that there is a significant loss of expression of these ZNFs in vivo in these lung, uh, primary lung adenocarcinomas that have been um, extracted and sequenced. Um, and so we think that this is potentially a mechanism that occurs uh, in vivo as well uh, in the initial stages of, of cancer. And so just to kind of um, close with this model, we believe that uh, when you introduce mutant KRAS into these lung cells, that there is this both epigenetic silencing of these uh, crab zinc finger genes, as well as this epigenetic activation of these interferon stimulated genes. And so the loss of these ZNFs globally in these cells leads to this loss of repression of these repetitive transposable element derived non-coding RNAs, which are then significantly upregulated in our mutant KRAS cells, which then leads to this RNA-based uh, mechanism for uh, induction of these interferon-stimulated genes as well, as I showed you through activation of MDA5 and RIGI and PKR to a lesser extent. And so we think that this ISG signature that we see in these mutant KRAS cells is both through transcriptional as well as post-transcriptional mechanisms of activation. And so if you want to read more about this work, uh, please check out our preprint uh, that is on BioArchive right now. And just to kind of end, um, we also wanted to really see, are there extracellular RNA signatures of mutant KRAS? So I just showed you all the data for the intracellular signatures, but we also wanted to see if we isolated extracellular vesicles and then performed RNA sequencing, could we also see these same non-coding RNA signatures of, of mutant KRAS? And uh, in fact, we, we could see that. And so here, um, this is just some uh, nano uh, site data showing you the size distribution of these extracellular vesicles that are being released from these mutant KRAS lung cells. You can see that, for example, in the control cells, most of the vesicles are kind of of this micro vesicle size. But then in the KRAS mutant cells, we see that there's kind of a slight shift in the size, both a little bit larger, as well as to the smaller exosome size, which is canonically between 30 to 150 nanometers in diameter. And when we performed RNA sequencing of these extracellular vesicles, we could see that when we compare the intracellular versus the extracellular RNA, that in the extracellular vesicles, there is this significant enrichment of these long non-coding RNAs that are being released from these mutant KRAS cells, whereas there's not as much of this very profound bias in the protein coding genes. And so we think that these long non-coding RNAs are potentially very promising biomarkers for this mutant KRAS um, signaling uh, within these lung cells. And so right now, our lab is really trying to develop these RNA liquid biopsies for cancer early detection, focusing specifically on these RAS-driven cancers, such as lung and adenocarcinomas, where it is thought to be this initiating oncogenic hit. And so what we can see is when we isolate these extracellular vesicles, that these RNAs are actually in quite a pristine state. They haven't been degraded. Uh, we see full-length RNA transcripts within these extracellular vesicles, which we can then sequence using RNA-seq. And uh, we want to tr try to understand uh, what are kind of the earliest signatures where we can detect this non-invasively using a blood-based biopsy. And so uh, we've been doing this now um, in collaboration with um, Ukan Dumerji's lab at Stanford. Uh, and we're really seeing very specific signals and signatures not only coming from these annotated long non-coding RNAs, but also from these transposable element-derived RNAs as well. So with that, I um, just want to thank all the people in the lab that contributed to this work. This was really spearheaded by a very talented graduate student in my lab, Roman Reggiardo, and again, in collaboration with, uh, with the Demergy Lab at Stanford, the Collison Lab at UCSF, as well as the Broad Institute. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, daniel.kim at ucsc.edu.